So what we're going to be doing today is talking about sleep, trying to really ground you very quickly in what sleep is, but then most of the talk is going to be on how do you assess for sleep and with the focus of sleep and the problems that our IBD patients or pediatric IBD patients have with sleep and then the treatment options available. So sleep is a behavior. It follows a circadian rhythm. It's not uniform, it's organized into different cycles, and we'll touch base on those. And um, it's still moving on its own. I can talk fast, I can't talk that fast. Um, the two main... It's probably the way the PowerPoint is constructed. It was a room next door that was getting... <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, that's scary, because I just finished teaching hypnosis for talking about paranormal things happening, so all right. Um, now I have back the control for my talk. So the stages of sleep. There, um, REM and non-REM sleep are sort of the two major stages. REM sleep is associated with most of our dreaming. And as we go later and later into night, REM sleep takes more and more time of our sleep, um, accounting for approximately 25% of our sleep. The non-REM sleep we call deep sleep. Uh, the deep stages of sleep. And what's important there is growing number of studies showing that it's the non-REM sleep is where when we're having repair of inflammation, including the bowel, that it's occurring during the non-REM, non-dreaming sleep. So different electrophysiological things happen in different stages of sleep. So um, you see this here, and there's differences in what we do with our respiration, um, with heart rate, blood pressure, and then with what our brain waves are doing. So again, um, this is really just to stamp in what a complex phenomena sleep is. Sleep deprivation for all of us is bad. It causes cognitive impairment. Um, it impairs immune system functioning. It increases our risk for obesity, type 2 diabetes, again, over a lifetime. So sleep deprivation, again, is something that is really worth targeting. In our kids, it can actually lead to growth suppression and um, increased obesity. And again, these are normal kids, even outside of IBD. So we're going to focus, um, I tried to organize this in a way that it would make sense to map right onto the treatment we're talking about. So when we're talking about sleep and what controls sleep, there's sort of three areas that we think of. The sleep drive, so it's basically how long have you been awake and how active you've been, and so how tired you are when you go to sleep. The biological clock, it's our natural rhythm, so even if you're not looking at a clock or your watch, your body has a natural rhythm that it follows 24 hours a day, and it's called our circadian rhythm. And um, it really sends very strong signals to our brain when we should be awake or asleep. And then mental, physical, or medical issues really can affect sleep. So what we do cognitively, the things we worry about, um, when we're, our brains are dealing with pain, they're very strong drivers of sleep. So we're going to talk about how we can affect these systems and how do we get these systems working um, together to help our patients sleep better. So what controls sleep? So this is, um, I, I always um, like pictures, they speak a thousand words. So this is the sleep drive. So the longer you have been awake, and then the more active you are, the more tired you're going to be when you get to sleep. And um, there's an optimal point that you can reach of when you will naturally want to, within 15, 20 minutes, like literally have your head hit the, the pillow and fall asleep. So we need a high level of sleep drive, and we'll talk about some of the things that our patients do quite a lot that interferes with this sleep drive. The biological clock, so we talked about that, the awake sleep cycles. So again, when we're trying to help people with sleep, whether it's falling asleep better or staying asleep better, we really need to understand where their sleep drive is and where their sort of what their natural cycle is. And we do this with sleep diaries. It doesn't matter what sleep diary you use, sleep diaries sort of track when people wake up, when they go to bed, how they're sleeping in between, and then what they're doing and not doing um, during the time, during the day as activity-wise, and then right before the two hours before they try to fall asleep. There's a lot of sleep disorders. We are going to really talk mainly about insomnia, 
Hypersomnia is basically um, sleeping longer than eight, nine hours, but not having restorative sleep, so waking up still feeling fatigued. All of these others have specialized treatments, and we think about them, we screen for them, but we're not gonna focus on their treatment today. So sleep and IBD, so there's been some work done, um, increasing work um, showing that adult IBD patients have sleep disturbance. Um, we have our own colleague here from Boston, uh, Dr. Marketsky, who's shown that steroids can really, in a, in a subset of vulnerable kids, like literally wipe out sleep or at least um, cause many um, awakenings during the night. And then um, in some of my work in Pittsburgh, we screened almost 1,000 kids um, for depression. And um, of the entire 1,000 population, 42% um, reported a sleep disturbance. And I'll show you the measure that we use, the PISCI, the Pittsburgh Sleep Inventory um, Quality Index. When we looked at our depressed cohorts, so those who met criteria for clinically significant depression, 80% of those had a significant, so clinically significant sleep disturbance on a screen instrument. Um, this is a complicated slide, but um, the PISCI um, probes um, these domains of sleep. So are, do you think you're having, it's all self-report, do you think you're having a sleep disturbance? How long do you sleep for? How long does it take you to fall asleep? Um, what's your sleep efficiency? Sleep efficiency means um, time in bed and time asleep. What is that? Um, it should be no more than a 15-minute uh, difference um, if you're sleeping ideally. Daytime dysfunction is the sleepiness. Subjective sleep quality um, is how many times are you waking up and then the, what sleep medications you're on. Now, just again, to put this into context, it looks like um, the magenta here is that you don't really have any impairment at all, and then any other color means you have some degree of impairment. Um, this instrument is a scale of 0 to 21. Anything that's greater than a 5 actually is something that is indicating a clinically um, treatable sleep disturbance. But as you can see, it's made up of sort of different aspects of sleep problems. So we really need to understand where our patients are suffering. Sleep and information. So a growing field across medicine but um, disease activity, including an inflammatory bowel disease, but other diseases correlated with sleep quality and duration. Um, inflammatory biomarkers, so elevated um, inflammation is correlated with daytime fatigue. We can also add to that some of our, um, our treatment agents can also um, cause fatigue. And um, really, we know that inflammation, sleep, and depression are interrelated. We don't have a clue how. We can hypothesize and draw pretty pictures, but we really don't have large enough samples to know. But we know that that combination, if you have all of those three things going on, it's bad, and it's a good time to intervene. So for our patients, um, they can be depressed, they can be anxious, they can have social stressors. Nighttime bowel movements, and those patients who have um, ostomies are going to have, by definition, um, sleep disturbance and, and lack of quality of sleep during the night, and we'll touch upon that when we talk about interventions. Prednisone, again, for the vulnerable population can um, affect their sleep, and then we talked about the disease activity. So how do we assess for sleep? So um, the history and the physical, for the history we look for obesity. Um, obesity is one risk factor, um, even in children, for sleep apnea. Um, snoring is the other um, indicator. So if we have a, a child who the parent is reporting they're snoring and they're obese, um, we're gonna send them to a sleep specialist. Um, we'll talk um, a little bit about the questionnaires, actigraphy. Polysomnography is basically when you put a cap on, you put electrodes on, and you can get into the subtleties of those electronic changes in sleep. Um, those we really aren't going to focus on, because right now we use it for sleep ap apnea, narcolepsy, and then our sleep studies. To take a, a sleep history, I like bears. So what is the bedtime routine? Are you having excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue? How many times are you waking up during the night? Um, how regular is your sleep cycle? And then are you snoring? And again, we have different indices. We have sleep diaries to track this. Um, but that's a pretty good screen. And if, if you're getting um, actually a yes on any one of those categories, but certainly if you have are detecting a signal in any at least two of those categories, um, that can indicate um, something that um, would benefit from intervention. 
Actigraphy is basically a fancy watch that you wear, um, and um, they're about $800 a piece, so they're not inexpensive, but once you put them on, they stay on, and they're very resistant to anything, even the shower, and basically they are picking up subtle variations in motion. And so it's a wonderful way to correlate, here's what we get, the signal we get. Um, oh, I don't have the pointer here. This is a normal, almost too good to be too true sleeper. So daytime activity, they're going to bed at the same time every night, they're actually um, not having very much signal or movement during their sleep, and then they're getting up at the same time every morning. This is what we call a train wreck. So they're taking naps, they're having all sorts of movement, awakenings, they're going to bed and getting up. Um, so this is sort of the typical kind of patient we would see um, in our clinic who's coming with a sleep problem. And so, um, and then we get to see how well does the actual objective data correlate with what they're reporting on their um, subjective sleep measures. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, sleep disturbance. And I put this here um, not to just mesmerize all of you, but um, really actually meditation and sort of uh, having a relaxing fixation point. Um, the problem why most people don't sleep is their brain won't turn off. We just want our brains to shut down when we go to sleep. And so actually using guides like these can be very helpful if um, interfering worries and worries that aren't needing um, medication um, are sort of the interfering factor. When we're thinking about targeting sleep mechanisms, so um, you see the, um, this is again showing the neural mechanisms, <laughs> I turn this the right way, um, right here is our brain mechanism, so we have cortical involvement, hypothalamic and brainstem arousal involvement, and our pharmacological centers will target the brain directly but those map onto the physiological processes. So we talked about the sleep drive, the circadian rhythm, and the um, psychophysial cognitive arousal, the worrying um, and pain. And so this is where our cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, in sleep, it's the gold standard. There's nothing more effective either in adults or kids than our behavioral interventions. And I'll tell you what those are. Behavioral, pharmacological, and phototherapy are the three we'll focus on. So it's really simple. All we need to do, and you saw that mess of an actogram, is line up people's sleep drive with their biological clock. And once you have these two in sync, people who are suffering from insomnia, and actually to a degree the nighttime awakenings that aren't driven by something like diarrhea, actually within about a two week period with um, one face-to-face -face session and a couple of phone sessions and electronically downloading their sleep diaries to us to check with behavioral manipulation, we line these up and about 60% of especially kids are good to go. So what does this entail? You need consistency. So this is really hard with our adolescents, but if they're having enough daytime fatigue, and especially as we're selling this as an experiment that we ask them to try for a couple of weeks, we can get most of them to do it. So you don't go to bed until you're tired. Um, if you're not falling asleep within 20 minutes, get up. Don't watch the clock. And what we're trying to do is get your time in bed to be your actual sleep time. Now we use a bunch of behavioral maneuvers of pushing back, and forward, wake up time, sleep times, we might actually even get them artificially tired for three or four days to get that sleep drive up. So we're doing behavioral manipulations to align the, the biological clock with their sleep drive. But again, it really doesn't take a lot of training with the staff to do that. And then once you get them doing that and they're feeling better, it sells itself. Behaviors that hurt sleep, again, um, alcohol and caffeine, and a significant number of our adolescent patients are using caffeine, prescription drugs, um, thinking and ruminating about bad dreams, poor sleep environment, using your bed for other things than sleep. So a lot of our kids are using all their electronic gadgets, light stimulation for the eye, not good, pineal gland doesn't like that to shut down, um, and or um, texting. So again, if you're sensitive, um, we have to try to find a way to move those activities. Um, and naps longer than 20 minutes, actually, even if you are having an IBD flare, actually will negatively affect the sleep cycle. Sometimes we have to use naps, especially for kids who have ostomies and aren't sleeping regularly, but we try not to. Relaxation hypnotherapy, again, um, there's growing scientific support for this. 
I wanted to spend the last uh, five minutes, and I hope I get the time back that the clock was messed up, um, for um, you know, what we can do with kids and medications. So these are all the neurotransmitters that are involved in wake promoting and sleep promoting. So there's a lot going on here in neurotransmitter candidates. There's a lot of potential targets here. Um, there's pros and cons to medications. Um, they do work. They work quickly. Almost all of the meds we use to help people fall asleep or stay asleep do affect the architecture, so the REM versus non-REM ratio, and they don't necessarily lead to restorative sleep, so people feel fatigued, and often it's one of the side effects, especially in kids, the residual grogginess. Um, they can have an addictive potential. All of them actually have a tolerance potential, so all sleep meds for everybody are meant to be used short term as a way to jumpstart the lining up of those two systems, but they're really, with very rare exception, designed to be used chronically or for longer than a three-month period. And then the side effects, the adverse effects. Um, so some general principles that we really want to understand what is driving the sleep deprivation, so the diaries are key. Um, medication is rarely the first line choice. Actually, for kids, there's no FDA-approved drug um, for use of sleep, so that's really important. Behavioral therapy is effective, and even if you're using a sleep medication, it should be as an adjunct to the behavioral techniques we talked about. And again, the side effects. Um, you know, as a group, in GI, we like to prescribe SSRIs. Um, SSRIs actually make restless leg syndrome go through the roof. Um, I bet you most of you aren't assessing um, for that. And actually, restless leg syndrome can start in um, adolescence, and um, actually dopaminergic agents are the treatment of choice for that. Um, we want to consider when we're giving the drugs that we'll talk about, avoiding hazardous activities after the dose. Um, many of our kids will have paradoxical disinhibition from the drugs and REM suppression. So if we bring them off the drugs too quickly, they actually have um, rebound nightmares, which are horrific. And actually, in the SSRIs, many patients have nightmares, adults and kids. Um, so they sleep, but they're having nightmares, um, so it's a trade-off. Again, none of these drugs that I'm going to talk about are FDA approved, very few randomized trial. We usually use our clinical expertise, and again, um, we don't know what their long-term effects. There's a lot of brain development, brain uh, pruning, neurogenesis uh, that's going on um, during sleep, um, especially in growing brains, and we have no idea when we're using these medications how they're affecting them. What's available is pretty simple. Over-the-counter, there's antihistamines and melatonin, and then um, what's used in adults, benzos, the non-benzo derivatives, um, melatonin receptor antagonists that have not ever been tested in randomized trials, alpha agonists, antidepressants, and in rare cases, low-dose antipsychotics. The antihistamines people think are safe, but they can have morning drowsiness, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention from their anticholinergic side effects, and tolerance um, develops very, very quickly. They do cross the blood-brain barrier, so you're having a central effect. The benzodiazepines also, we have a lot of rebound insomnia and antigrade amnesia grogginess with them um, used in kids for sleep. So it also suppresses slow wave sleep, so that's really bad for our kids with IBD who are trying to boost their immune systems. The non-benzo um, alternatives are available. Um, they're less addictive. They have a minimal effect on the sleep cytoarchitecture. architecture, so things like Zolpidem. They are now coming available in more forms, so nasal and sublingual forms. Um, we have a lot of kids who complain of dizziness, hallucinations, and complex sort of sleep terror um, disordered behaviors when we use even tiny doses of these. And so we really use them extremely rarely and um, leaning toward never, if possible. Sometimes they come to us on these agents, then we have to be very careful about withdrawing them. The alpha agonists can um, actually be used um, and are often used actually in kids with ADHD to help them calm. That's where it was most studied. But they can actually be used to sort of help kids settle down to sleep, um, again, changing the sleep cycle architecture and having the side effects. I mean, all of these, it's a repetitive story. And then the antidepressants, um, the SSRIs change. They, they're um, suppressing slow wave sleep again, and our tricyclics have a lot of side effects. Um, trazodone we use 
quite a bit in adolescents, the PCPs like to use that. The two randomized trials that were used trazodone for insomnia in adolescents were both highly negative. It did not differentiate from placebo, had very large side effects. And then last but not least, uh, melatonin. So it has both hypnotic and chronobiotic. So chronobiotic is affecting that diurnal, pushing sort of the diurnal clock and adjusting it. Um, when it's used, it's used in um, doses of one to six milligrams. Remember, it's over the counter, so you don't really know what you're giving. You don't know what else is in there. And there are now several case reports where melatonin has been associated with increased immune reactivity. So you really have to monitor that. Um, I don't think the jury is out about that, but just to be aware. And then ending with phototherapy. So this is bright light therapy using a 10,000 lux um, lamp. It's actually used for seasonal affective disorder without medication um, very effectively. And it's now being studied and with some very promising initial results. Used correctly and you need to know how to use this, but using it um, for 20 minutes a day, right when you wake up at the same time each day, again, at the right distance and not shining into the eye, but peripherally um, is having a significant effect on daytime fatigue, fatigue from inflammation, fatigue from our, our medications, and for our kids that have the fatigue from the, um, the ostomy and the diarrhea during the night. Again, those things we have to come up with more creative ways to help them to stay awake, alert, and be able to do what they have to do. Thank you.